Matthew 21, uh, we're we'll continuing on through our study of the book of Matthew, of course, it says there in uh, verse 1, And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, were come unto Bethphage, the mount, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to his disciples, saying unto them, go, over, uh, go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt uh, with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, uh, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, uh, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the full of an ass. And his disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. So, of course, we know in parallel passages they go, they find these animals, and they loose them. And in fact, somebody does say, Hey, what are you doing? Why are you taking my animals? And they say, The master has need of them. And they say, You know, they, they let them go and take these animals. And really, that in itself is kind of interesting. Um, some people have kind of, I've heard say, well, you know, um, it's just uh, it's just God's providential, uh, Him just providing His needs, uh, you know, miraculously. And uh, there is, of course, a grain of truth to that. But I think the guys that let these animals go, when they said the Master hath need of them, he, they knew who they were talking about. And I think that it was them, um, you know, uh, giving of what they had uh, yeah. to God that God might be glorified. Of course, that's a great picture that we can get of that, that we should use what we have to glorify God, to let Him use the things that uh, He has uh, given to us so that we might uh, give Him glory as well. And I really don't want to spend a lot of time on that point of it. But I do want to point out here in verse 5 where it says, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the colt of the foal of an ass. Of course, this is being... Uh, it's referenced uh, is uh, Zechariah 9 9 you have to turn there where it says rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold thy king cometh unto thee he is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt uh, upon a colt the foal of an ass now one thing that's always kind of tripped me up about this passage is the fact that it's talking about two animals I mean a lot of I don't know if anyone's ever noticed that but it's, it's really clear here that it's a colt and the foal of an ass now a colt or a foal is the is the young, it's the offspring. You know, so it was the ass and the colt, the foal of an ass. So these are actually two animals that they brought to them, and we see that elsewhere in the Gospels where this is recounted that they brought two of them. And it says that they sat them, he sat him upon them, and he rode them. So we got to have to kind of think about exactly how this took place. Now, one silly notion that I've heard is that he straddled them, right? Which is just <laughs> ridiculous. Why would I've heard someone say that? You know, or maybe he put his feet on one and it sat on the other. It's just, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. But you know, you can understand like what they're trying to make sense of this. And I really think I've narrowed it down to just kind of two options. There's really, I think, two things of how this you know, logistically played out: when Jesus rode these animals, or or, or if he rode them both, or if he only rode one. Uh, there was definitely two animals there. I believe that. Now, one option would be is that Jesus rode both of these animals at different points. So you have to remember to get the uh, geography a little bit. When he's coming to Bethany and Bethagy, uh, near to the Mount of Olives, that's on the other side of the mount. So now he's going to ascend the mount and then come down into Jerusalem. So that's where this is all taking place. Mm -hmm. So some people will say, you know, um, I've heard it said that maybe perhaps he rode both of these animals at different points. And he would have rode the stronger animal, the ass, the adult version of this animal, up the hill, right? Because that would have been uh, where the animal would have needed to be stronger to bear that load and to ascend the hidden Mount of Olives. And then when he got there, he might have switched animals and rolled the colt, the bull of an ass, down into Jerusalem because that would have been the weaker animal, it would have been easier to do. And that makes good sense, especially if you try to, and, and again, I talked a little bit about this last week uh, when we were going through Matthew, last Sunday night, in fact, where we were talking about how God sometimes uh, le lets us kind of figure out these details for the main purpose that we can make different interpretations so that we can apply, make different applications in our lives. And I think this particular option, this particular interpretation of how this might have played out, oh, it's not one I necessarily am on board with, has some good image, has some good symbolism to it, I think. First of all, you have that stronger, that older animal, which would be the Old Testament, right? And it's laboring under the load of God, Christ, trying to go up the hill. It's a difficult task. It's not easy. And then you have Jesus at the top of the hill, also, you know, again, God, getting on a weaker animal and going down, something that's easier to do, something that it doesn't require effort, um, you know, to a certain degree. Of course, no illustration is ever perfect, you know, and I'm sure we could sit here and even find, perhaps try to find holes in that. 
But I do think that's a good uh, picture of the older animal representing the Mosaic Law, the labor, the work, the effort, and then the, the cult going descending, you know, the ease of just simply believing in Christ. Um, you know, and there's, there's other scriptures that we can kind of might come to mind as we think about that. And uh, Acts 15, it says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the uh, manner of Moses. So these were men, uh, the, the Jews that I believe, that were coming down and trying to bring them back into bondage, into certain aspects of the law, saying that they needed to be circumcised. And then it says there, um, But there arose up certain the sect of, of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So he's trying to teach these believers to keep the law of Moses again. And they were rebuked, and when they said, Now wherefore, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers, uh, our fathers uh, nor we were able to bear? So again, the law the, the, uh, that is likened unto a yoke, the, the law of Moses, the circumcision, this is being likened unto a yoke, you know, of, of something you would put on an animal. So you can kind of see how this might play out, where you know this might have some good sense to it, where the old animal is the Old Testament, the young animal is the New Testament. You know, cult, the cult is bearing Christ easily, you know, descending the mount. And Jesus, what did Jesus say about his yoke? He said, "Come unto me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For uh, my yoke is easy and my burden is light." Mm -hmm. Right. So that that could, that make, that that would work. I would go with that. Um, I wouldn't object to that. I tend to think. Uh, this next option is one I probably would lean more towards, is the fact that Christ rode the colt exclusively. That's what I think. I think he rode. Yes, both animals were there. And when you read the when you read Matthew and you read Zechariah, it does kind of the language kind of speaks to he. They set him upon them, you know. But speaking more, I think it's just kind of a manner of speaking that he had both of them there. The one had the clothes, you know. It, it was a uh, and the fact that the colt was one of where on never any man sat. So it was kind of a a special thing for him that that would have been important that it would have been only Christ that sat upon this 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 cult. And I think that there's also some really good um, application that you can make from that, from the fact that maybe Jesus only rode the cult, you know, the exclusively up the mount and down the mount. And if you would turn over to Luke chapter 19 because I I think Luke gives us a good uh, you know, the the account in Luke seems to kind of give us a timeline, it gives us an order of events of how perhaps this played out specifically. It says there in Luke chapter 19, look at verse 28, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem, and came, and it came to pass when he has come nigh to Bethany, and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. So here he is coming to the mount. He sent to his disciples, saying, Go ye in the village over against you, in which at entering you shall find a colt tied, where I never, uh, yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Uh, thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they were that were with, the, uh, they, and they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners uh, thereof uh, said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? They said, The Lord hath need of them. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and Jesus sat thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. Mm. And when he was come nigh, even now to the descent of the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began, a uh, uh, multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works which they had seen. So, again, Luke is only focusing in on the cult, but we know from John and we know from Mark and we know from uh, Matthew here that there was an ass and, and, and the cult full of an ass. That there were actually these two animals here. And Luke gives us this order of events. He says Jesus comes to the mount near Bethany and he sends his disciples to, for the cult. Right again, he's coming to the mount. And they go, they bring the colt to him, and the colt is brought unto Jesus, and he's sat thereon. And after having been sat on the colt, Jesus comes nigh at the descent of the mount. Did you see, did you see that there where it says, and as they, uh, and when he was, uh, look at verse 37, and when he was come nigh, now at the descent of the Mount of Olives. So this is not saying that he was done descending, that he, he was coming to the descent. He was at the, the, the pinnacle, he's at the precipice of the mount. Ready to descend into it. If, you, if this was taking place after he descended, the Bible would probably read something along the lines where it does elsewhere. Uh, having descended. You know, it would have said that. It would have spoken to it and it, it, about it in past tense. But now this is saying that he was come nigh, need now at the descent of the Mount of Olives. He's mm -hmm. already on the colt. Yeah. And so I believe that he actually rode that one animal all the way up and all the way down. 
and perhaps the the ass was just there, you know. Or maybe, or maybe, you know, maybe it was only the colt that was there. Maybe some people would even say that was the only animals there. I tend to think both animals were there, but he, he rode specifically the colt. And you say, well, um, well, what would be the point of that? What what would be the uh, imagery of that? Now, of course, anything Jesus does, he's going to do on purpose, and there's going to be a reason behind it. Yep. You know, he's going there's going to be reasons behind the things that he does. And I think him riding the weaker animal there and back, uh, you know gives us a good idea of the fact that God uses the weaker things of the world to accomplish His will. Now, <clears throat> you know, the understanding, ultimately, the main application of all this, no matter what animal He rode, is that Christ came meekly, is that He came humbly. You know, He came riding upon, He didn't come on a noble steed, you know, He didn't come riding on some king's horse. You know, He came on a, on a, on a beast of burden. He came on an animal that was used to do just everyday mundane tasks. That was not a very extravagant animal. It's not a, you know no one's ooing and awing over you know beautiful donkeys today, right? I mean that's you know the Esquitarian society, you know cult, uh, group, uh, group of people that 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 culture, that society. They're not you know uh, trying to breed the the finest Arabian ass. You know it's it's always like these nice you know beautiful horses. That's what everyone gets excited about. You never see a donkey with the braided hair doing the, like trot stuff, you know, and, and all that. It's always a big, beautiful horse. So again, the, the, the primary application of this, no matter what you believe about what animal he rode when, is that Christ came meekly, that he come with humility, and that he came as a servant. But I believe there is some more, some, you know, uh, uh, symbology here that we can get from some more meaning from the fact that, as I, I tend to think, that he rode that one animal exclusively. He rode that weaker animal. And it was up, you know, the weaker animal was able was able to do that, which is difficult. I mean, I'm sure having a full-grown man, uh, and I've heard others say, well, this just proves that Jesus was small. And, and I said, no, it doesn't prove that at all. The Bible says that there is no, he hath no comeliness that we should desire him. I believe Jesus, there was nothing uh, that was that would stand out about him. That if you would see Jesus in a crowd, he would look like an average man. Yeah. He wasn't a midget. He wasn't a dwarf. He wasn't like Saul. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't a Zacchaeus, right? The Bible says Zacchaeus was a was a little man, right? It says we know that about him. He was a low. He had a small stature, and that that was something noteworthy in Scripture, you know. And that was something you would have noticed about him, you know. And Saul was a man that was head and shoulders above all the rest. Yeah. So these are men that would have stood out in a crowd. I don't believe Jesus would have stood out. So, no, I don't believe him riding the smaller colt proves that he was a lighter or smaller man. But it just simply proves that God uses the weak things of the world to confound the things which are wise. You know, or the, 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 the foolish things to confound the wise, the weak things to confuse the things which are mighty, as it says in 1 Corinthians 26. And, you know, it would, it would remind us of ourselves, really, that, that we are as that colt that God uses. And it's really through his strength and his ability that we are able to, you know, accomplish the work that God has given us to do. You know, whether it's a, we're, we're, we're struggling in life, going uphill, having to do something difficult, or we're going through a season of life where we're going downhill and things are, are easier for us. That we're always doing these things through Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things of the world, which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. You know, and the Bible says that, uh, that you know, Paul said that he would learn how to suffer, uh, both, he learned how both to, to abound and to suffer need, that he could do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth him. He was able to do all those things. And that's what I believe this cult would kind of represent to us. It would show us that Christ, through him, uh, you know, though we are the weaker animal, though we might be a weaker vessel compared to some, that God could still use us to bring glory to Himself. And uh, you know, it kind of reminded me a lot of the story on uh, First Corinthians or First Chronicles, excuse me, 15, uh, where they're bringing back the ark from um, from the house of Obed Edom. It had been in the land of the Gittites and you know the Philistines, and they they were bringing it back. And then Uzzah puts forth his hand and touches the ark because they put it on a cart and, and uh, it began to fall. God strikes them dead. They freak out. They put it in the house of Obed-Edom. And while it's there, Obed-Edom is blessed. So once David sees that it's being blessed again, he goes down there. But he does it the right way this time. He learns 
He understands how to do it the right way. He brings it back the right way. And the Bible says, you don't have to turn there, that when they went back down and they did it the right way, it says, so David and the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bullets. So the Bible says there that yes, I mean, you have to imagine this ark. I mean, it's made out of wood. It's got gold. It's, it's covered in gold. Yeah. Gold is an extremely, like, you hear people say that until you actually hold uh, some quantity of gold in your yeah. hand, you never really understand how heavy it is. No, recently I was, uh, I had opportunity to hold, um, how many ounces was it? I can't even remember, but it was, it, I think it was, I can't even remember how the stories and the illustrations fall apart. But it was just a small, I mean, it, was, it wasn't even the size of a candy bar. It was like this thin, and it was like just very small bar of gold. I don't know how many ounces or what it was. But man, that thing, I mean, that small thing was heavy. I mean, it was very heavy. So you have to imagine how heavy the ark must have been then. Yeah. And God, and these men have to hold this thing on staves and, and bear it. But the Bible says there that when they did things the right way, that God actually helped them, and he helped them to bear that ark. He actually lightened the load. So I think that's another, it just kind of reminded me that. You say, well, this colt, this poor little you know, animal had to carry that load and go up and down the animal. <laughs> But I mean, I, God, by all, it really could have made it very easy for him. You know, I mean, Jesus could have sat in that thing and have been like, you know, just putting a feather on there. And he could have made it that easy. And it's kind of the same way with us. You know, God gives us uh, things to do. He puts a burden upon us. Every man must bear his own cross. But he will also help us to bear that cross. He will also help us to do those things. We truly can do all things through Christ who strengthen us when we endeavor to do his will. So... Uh, but in either case, if you would, turn on to Genesis chapter 49. Because another interesting thing about this is that this passage, I believe, is actually a two-fold... It's, it's, it's part of a two-fold prophecy that's given to us in Genesis 49. When Jesus is you know, uh, coming on this, on this, um, this cult, this bold mass, that says uh, in Genesis 49, of course, this is when um, uh, uh, Joseph Isaac is, is, is blessing... Uh, the twelve sons, or not Isaac, I meant Jacob. Jacob is, is blessing his twelve sons, telling the things which shall be in the latter days. And he gets to Judah here in, in chapter 49, verse 8 of Genesis. It says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now remember, Jesus was, was of the tribe of Judah. He was of the lineage of David. And so this is a, a prophecy about him. Look at verse 11. It says, Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. And then it goes on and says, He washed his garments in wine and, clothed, uh, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now, I believe this is actually two prophecies. This is prophesying Christ's first coming here in verse 11, where it says, binding his wool unto the vine. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the vine. I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Except you abide in me, you can accomplish nothing. You can do nothing. So Jesus, we see, he, he says that he's the vine, and we see this binding of a wool unto the vine. I believe this is a prophecy of his first coming. And then, of course, the latter half, would be where it says he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white, teeth, teeth white with milk. This would be a second coming. So mankind has seen the foal bound to the vine, the true vine, the living uh, Jesus Christ who came as king humbly and meekly. They've seen that part of the prophecy. We've seen that take place. But mankind is also going to behold the second part of this prophecy. This is yet to be fulfilled when he comes upon another beast. Okay, this time he's not coming upon a meek and lowly colt or, or an ass. He's not coming on a donkey. He's coming in great power, with great glory, and he's coming on a white horse, the Bible says. And he's, we're going to be following with him. Of course, we know that's in Revelation 19, where it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Right? You can see how this is all tying in here. That you know his his eyes shall be red with wine, his eyes shall be as flames of fire, and on, on his head were many crowns, and he hath a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
And what does it say? And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And what does it say back in Genesis? It said that his clothes in the blood of grapes. Right? So this is all imagery, right, of what's going to take place. So I believe that that was kind of interesting too, that this was that Jesus coming on that colt that was actually half of that prophecy, him being bound unto the vine. I believe that was what that was prophesying. But you know, whatever whatever you get out of that, you know, regardless of how you think that played out specifically, the point is is that Jesus Christ came humbly and meekly, but he's coming again, you know, and he's going to come and not humbly and meekly, he's going to come with great power and glory and with the angels and with you know, the saved, the saints of heaven, and he's going to, you know, wash his clothes in the blood of his enemies. Amen. He's going to dip his vesture in blood. He's a man of war. Yep. He's going to slay them with the word of his mouth. So, um, you know, that's kind of an interesting passage there. But let's go ahead and move on because there's like over 40 verses and we got to get through this. So it says in verse 10, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, and Jesus went in the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and lame came unto them in the temple and he healed them. <coughs> so Jesus, when he gets in after this triumphal entry of people casting their clothes in the way, casting palms in the way, Seeing Hosanna in the highest, uh, you know, and just glory, holly, just praising God, and, and, and just and, and just great time of rejoicing. The first order of uh, business that Jesus takes care of is he goes in the temple, and he starts to purge it. He starts to overthrow the, the the money changers' tables and chasing them out. And if you recall, this is the second time that he had done this. You know, this three years prior, you know, he had gone in, but and the only difference is that time he actually sat down and took the time to braid a whip. And went and drove him out with a whip. This time, there's no mention of a whip. It seems like he just went in there and just bare hands, just nothing else, you know, was able to just throw these people out. And it was the second time that Jesus had done this. So, in both cases, when you know, when Jesus first did this, and this time, we see that there's something that really upsets God, and this is something that everyone should take a, a heed to. Churches should pay attention to this. Is that? God uh, does not like when things are being sold in His house. Right. You know, it's it's the in both cases it's the act of selling. It's not even what's being sold. It's the fact because remember doves are part of the sacrifices. Yep. They need to have that, and they are even instructed to buy the sacrifices when they get there. If the journey be long for them, that they are to change into money and buy a sacrifice. But they are to do that outside the temple, not within the temple. All right. And of course, that probably evolved into other things where they're actually exchanging money, you know, there might have been different currencies going on and, and things like that. So, you know, the point being, though, is that God does not appreciate it when things are sold in the house of God. That is what's being addressed. And uh, it's where they were selling it, not what they were selling it, is what angered Jesus. And that's why he told them to take those things elsewhere. He said, take these things hence. He didn't say quit selling them. He just said, take them elsewhere. Get them out of here. Yeah. You know, do this somewhere else. So we should not sell items or conduct business in the house of God. That's what we and that's what we practice here. That's why all the things in the back shelf over there are by our door. Those are all free. You know, we don't sell anything here. You know, we don't sell the hymnals, we don't sell anything. You get you're welcome to that stuff and, and take it home and hand it out. And uh, you know, if you ever see anybody back there trying to collect. Let me know, right? <laughs> yes, that's not, that is not ordained. Amen. Now, I do want to take time just kind of explain this further because I think sometimes people, uh, they, they, they respectfully, you know, and out of, out of a good heart, they kind of get a little carried away and they've expressed concerns. I've even heard people express concerns over things like handing out a business card in church. You know, is that allowed? Now, I'll say this. If you come into church with a stack of cards... And you're walking up, hey, I'm Brother Corbin, uh, nice to meet you. I just want to know about my services that are available here. And you were going around just soliciting people in church, then yeah, that would be a problem. Because that would be you trying to conduct business for profit in church. Amen. Yeah. Now, if somebody knows what you do, you know, and says, hey, you, you're, you're a plumber, you're an electrician, they know what you do, they've just gotten to know you. Say, hey, you got a car? I might need your, your services one day. Yeah. I don't think you have to say, well, let's meet up over at the Circle K after services and I'll get you a car. <laughs> You know, there's a difference there. You kind of, I think you have to kind of use your head a little bit. Where is your heart at? You know, you're not coming in just handing out cards and flyers and yeah. filling out invoices. 
But if someone just knows what you do and says, "Hey, I want one of your cards," I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. You know, like 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 you need to maybe just go across the parking lot to do that or something like that. Because here's the thing: we still do some kind. I mean, church is called business. Yep. You know, this matter of this business. That's why they they appointed deacons over the church to to look after this business, right? Jesus said, "I must be after about my Father's business." So, <coughs> excuse me. The the ministry is a business. And there are certain elements that we have to address as a business with, within a church. You know, should we not count the offering? Should we not fill out bank deposit slips? I mean, how far do you want to go with it? Yeah. Right. You know, uh, but the thing is, is that are you, are you buying and selling? That was what the problem was. It wasn't necessarily just because there was money there. You know, obviously there's, there's going to be money in the church because that's where we take up the offering and things like that. So um, we should not sell or conduct business in the house of God, you know, but that's not to say that you can't do something as innocent as hand out a business card if somebody asks you for one, you know, or, or something like that. Um, you know, or, you know, for example, we're going to build that wall at some point and I'm going to come down here and cut a check for Brother Elmer to get the materials that he needs. You know, you could say well, we're conducting business. Yeah, but we're not doing that for profit. Right. You see, there's there's a little bit of a difference here that between, you know, somebody trying to sell doves, make money, or have an exchange there with money and try to gain with through through exchange rates or something like that. There's a big difference between somebody just, uh, you know, doing things that are needful for the work of the ministry and actually trying to turn a profit in the house of God. Yeah. You know, if we were setting up, uh, you know, a stand back here and selling books. You know, and, and making a profit off of these books and selling all these things like that and, and selling our DVDs and stuff like that, that would be wrong. Yep. We're trying to make money. We're trying to fleece people. And uh, that, that and really, it comes down to this. You know, selling things and, and is a characteristic of false prophets. Now, I'm not saying everybody that sells something in a, in a you know, be it in a church or a Bible tent or a Bible college somewhere is a, a false prophet, Okay. But I'm just saying, you know, it's possible even as saints believers to do things that false prophets do. You know, to share characteristics with them. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 1, there were false prophets among the people, even shall there be, as there shall be false teachers among you. And it says that, and through covetousness and shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Right? So that's something that false prophets do. They try to make merchandise of people. They try to make a profit. They try to make money off of off of the flock, off of uh, the God's people, and that's just not something that we want to be associated with. And even that aside, we see the story here where Jesus is going to such great lengths of chasing people out of the temple on more than one occasion yeah. for doing what? For selling, for right. buying and selling things inside the house of God. So we should just not do it. You know, I mean, I'd rather get to heaven and find out we were wrong that we well, we could have been selling things. The whole time, you know, <laughs> than, and not have done it, than to find out we shouldn't be doing it and that we were doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'd rather err on the side of caution on this one. But I don't think, I think we got it nailed down. I yeah. think that that story is pretty clear. That's right. That we should not be buying and selling things in the house of God. And a lot of people, it's just amazing, even in Baptist churches, they'll read that story, yep. but they'll have the bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I've heard stories where they'll even, they'll, a new, somebody gets saved and they want to sell them a Bible. Good night. <laughs> Just give them a Bible. Right? Don't you want them to grow in the Lord? Don't you want them to, to, to know God's Word? But you're going to say, give me 15, 20 bucks or whatever for some Bible? It's ridiculous. You should just give that kind of thing. You know, buy the truth yeah. and sell it not. Yeah. Right. You know, we, we buy Bibles all the time from, from publishers, mm -hmm. not from churches, and then we give them away. We don't sell them. And that's the way it ought to be. We should be willing. We should be generous people. We should be willing to just give. Amen. <clears throat> you know, and that's something Faithful Word Baptist Church is very good at. I mean, our pastor is somebody who does not hang on to money. I mean, I, money just, it's just, it's a, I, he said, what did he say? It's God's, it's like God's uh, laundry, uh, laundering system. You know, we're, we're money launderers <laughs> for the Lord here. You know, we're taking the the, uh, the filthy man, and the evil man, mammon of this world, and we're putting, we're laundering it for God's work. You know, we're, we're putting it to use for, in the ministry. And you have to wonder, well, why is it that so much money is able to just come through uh, the, the bank account of Faithful Word Baptist Church is because when people send donations here, they know it's going to the work yeah, of God. Yeah, amen. They know it's going to go to pay for hotel rooms up on the Indian Reservation yeah. and buy dinner and pay for gas and, and, and planning and everything that goes into taking a group of people up 
to uh, you know that part of Arizona to go knock doors on an Indian reservation to see souls saved. That's Amen. the whole point of it. Yeah. So people are willing to give to a ministry when they know that ministry isn't just trying to hang on to every nickel and dime and build some giant building Amen. or build some school. Right. It's actually going into the work of God. Yep. So anyway, I'm kind of going off on, a, on a, a tangent here, but let's keep moving through the chapter. Verse 15 where it says, And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children and the crying in the temple, excuse me, saying, Hosanna, the Son of God, they were displeased and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? Jesus saith them, have you never read, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast per perfected uh, praise? And he left them and went out of the city unto Bethany and he lodged there. Now in the morning as he was returned into the city, he hungered. And he saw a fig tree in the way and, it came, and he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee hence, uh, henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when, Jesus, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this uh, which is done the, to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, it shall be done. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Now, this sounds like, when you first read that, like, wow, we could cast um, mountains into the sea. You know, that's, that's really cool. Obviously, I think he's, he's speaking, you know, um, you know, he's... Uh, it's, it's not literal here what he's saying, but he's just saying that's the power of prayer. You know, this is something that you have available to you. Mm -hmm. you know, and you always have to kind of take these things um, and understand them in the context of Scripture. This is not an endorsement of you know, the name it, claim it crowd. You know, if, if you want that new car, you just need to name it. You need to claim it. Jesus name it. You know what I mean? You want that Tesla, the new Tesla, you, know, you want that new flagship smartphone, or you want that whatever. You want that big, expensive house, you just need to clean it, brother. You know what I mean? You need to just in Jesus' name. You know? If you don't get it, it's because you got to sit in your life. You know, that's not that's not what this is. But the guys will turn to passages like this, and they'll they'll develop this whole doctrine out of this. That you can have the best and the brightest of everything if you just believe. And if you don't get it, it's because you didn't really believe. You don't have enough faith. You know, um, that's not what what Jesus is getting at here. See, I think a big part of prayer is our motives. God knows our heart. Our motives, believe it or not, play a big part in whether or not our prayers get answered the way we want them answered. Um, you know, if I were to go cast Mount Lemon into the sea, <laughs> and I believed it, I mean, first of all, I have to ask them, hey, you want that, Corbin? You know, well, I just want to prove that I have that great power of prayer. Yeah. You know, that's that's not a good motive. Yeah. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John 5, it says this, and this is the confidence that we have in it. If we ask anything according to His will, yeah. He heareth us. So our prayers need to be in accordance with God's will. We should learn what it is that God wants from us or what God desires for us in our life, and those are the things that we ought to pray for. And God will gladly give us uh, the desires of our heart if the desires of our heart line up with His will. You know, what, what purpose is it to, to you know, cast them out in the sea? You know, how is God going to get glorified out of that? You know, if a man actually was able to pray that prayer and have it happen, they wouldn't glorify God. They glorify that man. Yeah. Right? To say, wow, this guy can cast mountains into the sea. Yeah. This guy can can pray at trees and they wither up. What an amazing guy. You know, they would they put him on they take him on a tour. You know, and they'd show him off somewhere. You know, that's not that's not what Jesus is getting at. Yeah. What he's trying to get at is that yes, we have great power in prayer, and and when we understand the the whole of Scripture. You know, we have, truly, we have not because we ask not. And there's many things that we go up without in life that God does desire to give us. You know, we do have real physical needs even at times, and God is willing to meet those needs, but are we praying for them? Are we asking for them? Do we even have the faith to do that? You know, we, we say, well, it would be great to have the faith, you know, to cast a mountain in the sea, but we don't even have enough faith to ask God to help us, you know, pay these bills or to, to show us how to do this or to do that. And I'm not saying if you ask God to help you pay bills that He's going to send a check in the mail, you know. And, and, and if you give a hundred, you're going to get a thousand or whatever. That He's probably going to show to you and reveal to you that you could go work more, yeah. You know, and provide you more hours at your job, right? Or maybe you'll get a raise at your job. You know, these are the kind of practical things God isn't. God's very practical often when He answers prayer. Yep. Um, That's right. 
anyway, and you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but the Bible does say in Psalms 37, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. So we see, you know, how we're living plays a big part in how we're, you know, whether or not our needs are going to be met. You know, if we trust in the Lord and do good, you know, there, we have to be doing right. We have to be, you know, keeping that uh, sin account short and confessed and, and living for the Lord and doing those things that we ought to do. It says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also unto him, on, on him, in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You know, sometimes when, when we want a prayer answer, we have to ask ourselves, is this what God would want for me? You know, sometimes a lot of, I've heard it said this, all prayers are answers, just sometimes the answer is no. Right? <laughs> sometimes it's like, God, I asked that, and you, were like, you didn't answer my prayer. He's like, yeah, I did. I just didn't give it to you because that's not what you need. Because it's not what I would want for you. You know, it's not what, you're not delighting in me, you're not committing your way unto me. When we start to say, you know, I want to, I want to do this for the Lord, and I have this need, and, and you know, God will answer the prayers that are going to draw you closer to Him. So again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. So let's get into in, in verse 23 where it says, And he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest uh, thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask you one, I'll, I will, I also will ask you one thing. Which, if you tell me, I and, like, and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto, the, unto us, Why did why did ye uh, not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I uh, you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, the first came, uh, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, He answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They said unto the first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Now, this is verse 32 is a great verse to help clear up this doctrine about repentance, which is a big thing today. Because you have a lot of people today that will tell you that you need to repent of your sins to be saved. And I'm not saying, we're not against repenting of your sins. I'm all for it. We should be doing that every day. Amen. But when it comes to salvation, you do not need to repent of your sins Amen. to be saved. Amen. And if you say, well, yeah, you do. Well, then turn me to the verse where it says, repent of your sins and yeah. thou shalt be saved. Right. Mm -hmm. Go to the verse where, it, just find the verse where it says, repent of your sins. Yep. It's not there. Right. I could take you to the Book of Mormon and show you repent of your sins. Or repent of sins. Or, you know, I could take, we, and here's the thing. And I've heard so many just bad arguments to try and pe for people to make their case about how you have to repent of your sins to be saved. They'll say things like, well, you know, this doctrine used to be much more commonly held. This doctrine used to be believed on a lot more. People and people are different today. Nobody wants to get right with God. But back in the old times, in, in the former days, you know, we'll inquire about those, even though that's not wise. Those people back then, they, you know, they, they understood what it was to repent of your sins. And this is just an old doctrine that's been uh, glossed over and no one wants to preach it anymore. You know, we need to dust this old doctrine off and put it back on the forefront. But here's the thing. Lots of people pre teach and preach and teach that you have to repent of your sins. I remember when I first heard that argument, I was like, okay. So I went home and I got on the internet and I started looking at every local church, not just Baptist. At every community church I looked at, every single one of them, repent yeah. of your sins, repent right. of your That's sins. Right. This is not some long lost doctrine that's fallen by the wayside, that needs to be revived in these last days. That's, it isn't. This doctrine has been around for the Mormons preach it, the Witnesses preach it. Yep. Every false way has some kind of repent of your sins yep. salvation associated with it. This is not uncommon. This is why when we go soul winning, people will tell us, oh, you got to repent. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say that. The wrong way. It, 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 it is. It is the broad way. Exactly. Lots of people understand uh, or have been taught this. So that, that's a poor argument to say that it's some old lost doctrine that has to be revived. It is, it's, it's, it's alive and well. Yeah. It's, doing, it's doing just fine. 
but uh, they'll, but then they'll say things like, well, you know, all the prof all, all these men of God in the New Testament and elsewhere, they all preach repentance. But, Amen. They did. Yeah, no one's disputing that. That John preached repentance. But you know what he did say is repent of your sins yeah. and be saved. Mm -hmm. And this passage here, verse 32 here, is a great example of the repentance that God is looking for in person for salvation. He says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. They did not believe, right? It doesn't say, and ye continued with your drinking. <laughs> you know, and you continued with your fornicating and your sinful life. That's not the problem that he's addressing. He said, ye believed him not. You did not have faith in what he was saying. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. It doesn't say the publicans and harlots gave up their sinful life. Mm -hmm. It says that they believed what John was preaching. And when ye had seen it, and ye when ye had seen it, repented not afterward. And what was their repentance? That they might believe him. Yeah. That was what he was repenting for. That, that's the repentance that we need to see in people. Not giving up their sin, not cleaning up their life, and, and, and trying to, to, to walk a straight line in order to be saved. That is a works-based salvation. Right, okay. It is. How can you sit there and, and, and look me in the face and tell me that you, if somebody doesn't give up their alcohol or their, or their, uh, you know, their sinful relationship with some other person, uh, if they don't do that, then they can't get saved. I've had people tell me that. I've gone to preachers and said, hey, if there's a guy that hears the gospel, clear as a bell, understands it, believes it, wants to get saved, would you pray with him? Except here's the one thing, he's not willing to give up his alcohol. He's going to continue being a drunk. Would you pray with that guy? Would you lead him to the Lord? I would step back as a wise soul winner and let the wow. Holy Spirit minister to him until he's ready to, <laughs> to give up that alcohol, Wicked. give up that drinking. Yeah. That's, that's not Bible, friend. Yeah. You know, that you might sound like you know a wise soul winner. You might have yourself convinced. But here's the thing. We see sinful people getting saved in the Bible all the time. Right. And, and God didn't come to, 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 you know, to make everybody give up their sin. Because we're going to sin every day. Like how, how, What sins do I need to give up in order to get saved? Yeah. Now we've got to go knock on someone's door and say, well, it, it, the Bible does say whosoever uh, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But here's the thing, I'm, I'm going to need to know uh, some of your, you know, some of the bad habits you have. And then you, you need to think about these things. And I'll come back next week, and if you can check off this list of these particular sins that you're guilty of and get these out of your life, then we can talk about, you know, uh, you know, calling upon the name of the Lord. I mean, is that how we're supposed to conduct our soul? It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. This, and again, this is one of those doctrines that just deserves a whole sermon, and every time I get on it, I feel like going off on it because I, I really, this, of all the doctrines that I hate, I hate this one the most. Yeah. Because it's it's a wicked doctrine. And it's infected every so many Baptist churches are just there and they're just even ones that don't even believe this are repeating this. Yeah. Even the ones that would say salvation is by grace through faith and actually genuinely mean that. Even in their doctrinal statements, you know, they'll they'll repeat this nonsense because they just copy and paste and, and they don't they don't want to take a stand on it. You know, the Bible says in Acts 19, and then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on Him which should come after Him, that is, on Christ Jesus. That was the baptism of repentance. That was the repentance that, that John the Baptist preached, that they should go from unbelief to belief. Right, yep. mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of people, they try to separate repentance and belief, uh, you know, in order to add work salvation. You know, but, and, and here's how they do it. They go to Acts 20.20. 20, and, they, and, they, and it says in Acts 20.20, 20, you know, I kept back nothing... That was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying, and again, from house to house, okay? Don't tell me that going door to door ain't right. Yeah. And that's how Paul did it, okay? House to house. Amen. And he says, testifying both to the Jews and the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So they'll say, well, you see there? It's repentance towards God and it's faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> These are inseparable graces. That, that must be present in the sinner in order for him to receive a, a full understanding of the knowledge of salvation. There must be a repentance, a grieving of their sin towards God. And then the faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ comes. They try to separate repentance and faith. They try to make them into two different things, right? And here's the problem with that verse. You're also separating God from the Lord Jesus Christ. Like you're making those into two different people, right? Isn't it the same person? You know, you're going to tell me repentance and, and the faith isn't the same thing, right? Well, what about God and our Lord Jesus Christ? So, you know, here, but here's how you properly understand this. Here's the, here's the 2020 vision 
on Acts 20:20. 20, 20. It's actually actually from verse 21, but that preaches better. It says here, it says that you know the, the way to interpret this is the repentance towards God is the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. That is the that's the repentance. The repentance that you need to see towards God and someone to get saved is them putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what that verse means. And it's not, you know, repent of your sins towards God and then put your faith in Christ. It's not, that's, that's a bad way of interpreting Scripture. But also in this passage here, um, he uses, of course, we, if we notice there, the use of the vineyard in this parable, right? How he sends two sons to go work in his vineyard. One, one says he will not go, then repents and goes. And then the other one uh, says he will go and doesn't go. And then, of course, um, the use of, of a vineyard in, 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 in parables is something that was found in the Old Testament. This is something that Jesus used more than once. In fact, we'll see this in a minute. And uh, in Isaiah chapter uh, 5, you know, if I, I don't know if I really have time to go into this, but he talks about, if you would, go to Isaiah chapter 5 or something, because this is, this is kind of interesting, because it kind of ties in with what we're reading. Next, uh, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, I'll begin reading. It says, Now will I sing to my beloved the song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My beloved, well beloved had a vineyard in a fruitful, very fruitful hill. He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with, planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. And he made also a wine press therein. And he looked at that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have done to it, done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. So he's saying here, look, what more could I have done? I, I fenced it in, I pulled out the stones, I set up the, the press, I, you know, it was ready to go, it was on a fruitful hill. There's no reason it should have, it should have brought forth good grapes, but instead it brought forth wild grapes. And of course, this is you know being this is uh, being applied to uh, the children of Israel being in rebellion, not being following after the Lord their God, but following after uh, false gods and, and being judged for it. And we see this concept of God rejecting Israel is not a new one. That this is something that He has done often in the history of the children of Israel. Many you know they would go they would fall after a false way. They would start to worship false gods. God would reject them and judge them. And then they would come back, mm -hmm. right? And he uses this uh, this uh, vineyard here in Isaiah as kind of an example of that, of him, you know, doing everything that he could. And it reminds us of Jesus coming for, you know, doing the works that he did for three years, preaching the miracles. I mean, he he was pulling out the stones. He was setting up uh, the the uh, the wine press. He's fencing it in, and he's there. He's, what more could have Jesus done for these people to have them, you know, to to believe on him? What more could he have done? He said, if you believe me not for my words, believe for my very work's sake. Yeah. You know, for they testify of me. You know, there's a lot of things that, that uh, were done for the children of Israel that there's no reason that they shouldn't have believed. <clears throat> and what happened here in this parable in Isaiah, it says, and now I'll go to verse 5, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain uh, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry. So God's saying, I'm just going to wipe the vineyard out. And that's what he did, of course, with when Babylon came and took them captive. But he did this again with the children of Israel in 70 A.D., when the Romans came, after they rejected Christ, the Jews rejected Christ, the Romans came, and as Jesus said, not one stone was left upon another. They, they, they laid that vineyard waste, that Jerusalem waste. And uh, it's just something that we see happening over and over. So it just shows us you know, that this idea of God rejecting Israel is not anything new. It's something that went on in the Old Testament, and it's something that God has done today. He has rejected them. That's right. And if you look there at Matthew, where we were, let's get back into verse 34. Um, We'll get back in there and we'll see again. He's talking about a vineyard. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they may receive the first fruits uh, of it. Uh, verse 35, And the husband took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto him them likewise. 
But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. It's pretty obvious what it is that Jesus is getting at here. That he's sending the prophets, and the prophets, and they're killing, and they're stoning. And then they're sending, he sends his son, yeah. of course this is Jesus. Yeah. And instead of embracing him, and for who he was, the son, they are envious and jealous, and they kill him out of envy, so that they could have inheritance. They didn't want to give up uh, the kingdom. And they caught, they want to give up the vineyard, right? And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard. And that's what they did to Jesus, right? They slew him, they cast him out of the vineyard. They, they slew him without the camp, yep. outside the city. Uh, they said, unto, and when the Lord therefore uh, the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. And he will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him uh, the fruits in their season. So out of their own mouth, they answer the question, and they got it right. They got that he's going to destroy them and he's going to give it to somebody else that's going to bring forth the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, did you ever read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given unto a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So, I mean, could it be, could scripture be any clearer? Yep. The fact that God is going to take the kingdom from the Jews right. and give it unto the Gentiles. I mean, this is just something that we find throughout the New Testament. Yep. Just chapter after chapter, this is something that is hammered. And it just could not be any clearer. And yet you still have people today that will say, Oh, that's replacement theology, how dare you? You know, that's anti-Semitic. You know, those are God's chosen people. And what they're turning God into is a God, they're turning God into a respecter of persons. Yeah. They're saying, well, they're of a certain nationality. They're of a certain race. Therefore, you know, they're... They're, they're Abraham's descendants. Yeah. You know, they have a certain blood flowing through their veins. And somehow that's enough for them to just get a pass. Yeah. That they could just inhabit that land. No, friend, the Bible's very clear here. Yeah. That he was going to take it from them and give it unto another. Amen. That's called being replaced. That's right. So the, the term replacement theology is an accurate one. Yeah. And it's one that we proudly embrace amen. and say, Amen. Because that, that's what Jesus taught. Yeah. Is that he would take it from them and give it unto another. Not he would take it from them and give it to another, but they would get to come have it. You know, it's just like, where do they, I don't know where they get this from. Uh, you know, rep replacement theology is biblical and it's yeah. found throughout the New Testament. And again, it's a subject that deserves, as many of these other ones that we found in this chapter tonight, deserve whole sermons. And, and those will be preached at another time. But it says, you know, in Romans chapter 2, for example, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, yeah. neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, whose circumcision is that of the heart and, and, and in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So it's not, it's not your national uh, you know, identity that makes you a Jew today. That's not what God sees, how he sees Jews and Gentiles. He doesn't see Jew or Gentile. He's saying it's, you're not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but one which is one inwardly, you know, that whose circumcision is of the heart. Uh, being God's people is determined by what you have done with the Son. You know, the, the, the husbandman sent his son unto them, and they killed him. And that determines whether or not uh, whether or not you're God's people, whether or not you're going to serve him, is what you've done with Jesus Christ. That's what it all hinges on. It's not uh, necessarily your, your supposed ancestry. You know, they say, well, we're descendants of Abraham. You have a very hard time proving that. You know, that, that, that's all been so mixed up and... and, and and they've been scattered for so long, and, and there's been so much um, just mixing in, in genetics that how could anyone prove that? Yeah. that you're, you're the direct descendant of the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, good night. That's, that's a stretch. But, um, you know, again, the point is that it's what you do with Jesus Christ that determines whether or not you're God's people. Yeah. The Bible says in Galatians 3, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Who are the descendants of Abraham today? It's those who are believe in Christ by faith Amen. that have embraced the Son yeah. and, and for who He is. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the Gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. All nations. Not just one. Yeah. So then they which would be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For ye see the children of God by... Uh, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So, you know, Galatians 3 is clear. There's just many other passages we could turn to. 
But the point is this, that they have rejected Christ and God has rejected them. You know, and if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's what makes you God's child today. Not the color of your skin, not where your who your grandma or your grandpa was. That's a respecter of persons, and God is not a respecter of persons. And neither should God's people be either. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fly uh, the, the the five pointed was a five pointer or six pointed star of Remfan or whatever it yeah, is six back star. here and and, 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 and and saying all hail to the chief and and have the American flag on one side and the Jewish flag on the other and, and Israel can do no wrong, you know, and and Israel's fine, it's our fine. Sorry, John Haggy, that's yeah. you know you're Pentecostal. I know there's a lot of Baptists that believe like you on that point, but not this one. Yeah. You know, yeah. we don't we don't buy that here. Yeah, right. And they don't just get a pass. They, yeah. You know, if you if, you, if you've rejected the son, you, you know, if you have not the son, the same hath not the father. Yeah, right. You know. So anyway, again, we could go off on that. <laughs> but Jesus said, Whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall on, it will grind him to powder. You know, and if, there's no coming back from being powder. You know, what's your powder? That's it. You know, you can't just be reconstructed. And that's the that's the imagery of the fig tree too. It had the leaves. Oh, it looked good. This looks like the right tree. There should be fruit here. But there was none. Yeah. You know, there was wild grapes. There was no fruit on it. Yeah. And it's withered away. God's not just going to come back later. You know, but two thousand years later, you know, God has decided in 1948 or whatever to come back and. You know, revive the fig tree and it's reblossomed. And, and no, that's not biblical. That's a false doctrine. And here's the problem: is that Baptists need to just get in the King James Bible and take, you know, uh, the, the all the notes that they read. Yeah. You know, from from uh, who is who's the big guy? Alexander Schofield. I wanted to say Scorby, but he's good. Scorby's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have any notes, right? Yeah. Like I'm about ready to say Scorby. I'm like that is not right. It's another guy. It starts with S. No, Schofield's no. I mean, kick those things to the curb, yeah. man. Just read the Bible. You'll come out with a proper understanding yeah. of who God's people are and who they aren't if they would just get into it and trust what Jesus says and instead of trying to let some other man, you know, someone other than the Holy Ghost interpret Scripture for you. Yeah. Anyway, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. We'll be done.